What am I? What am I? We better not. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome back to this Bible study in the book of Exodus. Hope everybody is having an absolutely great week right now. So without anything else, guys, let's just pray and let's dive into Exodus 17. I've been waiting now two weeks. I, I want to know how this story ends. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father, we do thank you, God. We thank you, God, just for another day, God, that we get to come out, God, and worship you. God, we thank you so much for the meal tonight, God, for the fellowship here at church, God, just, God, seriously, for another day, God, to just get to worship you, God. I'm thankful for it, God. I thank you for this word that we study tonight, God, and I ask, God, that you bless us, God, for our obedience, God, to just be here tonight and be a part of this, God. God, we just ask for that blessing. Father, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm missing my batteries are dead in my little headset, so I'm going to get up closer to my, do my best Elvis Presley. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Kids once hung a sign in my classroom that said, Mr. Cole's dancing is too provocative for public schools. <laughs> we'll skip the dancing. And plus, the last time I did, I blew my knee out and ended up falling in the back of the church. So let's not do it. So without anything else, guys, let's dive into uh, Exodus chapter 17, uh, where we left off a couple of weeks ago. And... You know, as we jump in here tonight, there's two things instantly before we even start reading, you know, that's worth noticing is one, what short-term memories people have, what short-term memory people have, because we're going to see that out here tonight. And then the other thing is this, you know, they lived in a time where literally they weren't just randomly walking the desert. Y'all get that, right? They didn't end up anywhere by accident. They literally had this cloud that was God, that they were able to follow the very presence of God. So wherever the cloud moves, that's their sign to move. And wouldn't it be great in a way today if we have so many decisions we make, wouldn't it be great if we had like this cloud? I mean, that was a no-brainer. Clouds going that way. I'm following the cloud. That's the way the pillar of fire is right there. That's where I'm heading. And so that, that was just one of those things on my mind today was just the fact they had this ability to follow. And of course, I guess one of them would look at me and instantly go, well, what's it like to have the very spirit of God living inside you? So I can imagine from their side, looking back is like, you've got something that we could never dream about. We had a pillar of fire to guide us, but you have the very spirit of God living inside of you to help you make your way through the world. And you know, maybe that's one of the reasons as we read this, we're going to be very, I guess, probably uh, maybe critical of their behavior, but we do have to remember they did not have the spirit of God. They did not have the spirit of God within them. I'm sure if I ever met Abraham, I, that would probably be like, for me, what was it like for you to walk and talk with God? And then Abraham, I'm sure, would say, what was it like to have the very Spirit of God living inside of you? Because that's something he didn't know anything about. So let's think about that in the back of our mind as we roll into 17. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, if you remember, sin gets its name from Sinai. According to the commandment of the Lord, encamp in Rephidim. Rephidim just means rest. So literally, the word means rest. And so what's funny is, here they're heading to a place that's very name means to rest. But they get to the rest, and look at what happens. So you can imagine, but there was no water for the people to drink. I mean, this is kind of like, literally the word rest, it's almost like a rest stop on the interstate. So if you can imagine being driving down the interstate and be like, oh, there's a rest stop up there. I just want to get there. I just want to get there. And then you get there and the rest stop shut down and it's closed and there's no rest. And so here they've gotten to Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. 
And now remember, they got to Rephidim because they were following this pillar of fire. Verse 2, Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And me and Brother Pat was talking before y'all got in here today. One of the things is, I really like King James. In, in King James, it says, uh, therefore the people, instead of contended with Moses, it says chided. Oh, and they chide with Moses. And so that's one of those things where when you start trying to get words from Hebrew or Greek, and you try and put those in the English, sometimes it's really hard to find a good word. And so the word chide is actually a better deal because it's literally this idea of belly aching, complaining, griping, things of this nature. It's not just contending, but these people literally had a very foul disposition. The word chide is better because contend just isn't strong enough for what was going on. They were a very disgruntled and griping group of people. And so there's a lot of chiding. And so I made the joke, there's a lot of chiding in our country tonight. It's kind of an interesting use of the word, still applicable based on things that happened here. But that would have happened either direction. Somebody was going to chide today in this country, no matter how any of that went. So, but here he says, and look at what he said, therefore the people contended with Moses. And so here it is, they're following God, but once again, who did they choose to blame? They choose to blame Moses. Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said, I like this, why are you grappling at me? What are you grappling at me for? Why do you tempt the Lord? So he's trying to help them out. Don't you? We've been here before. Remember the bread? Don't you remember the bread? Don't you remember Egypt at this point? And guys, that's one of the things. And this is the why. This is why we gotta be very careful. I wish Nikki was in here right now because she was asking me something before we started tonight about something. And so you know, God's taken. God's taken them out of Egypt, but they've not been able to get the Egypt out of them yet. You know what I'm saying? They've still got some of that old life hanging on inside of them. And that's where, especially with a new Christian, we need to be more, we need to be a little bit loving, right? We need to be a lot loving would probably be a better way for me to say that. We need, though, to take a little extra care with a new Christian because this new Christian just got out of Egypt, which means for this new Christian, they still got a lot of Egypt they're hanging on to. We don't expect anybody to get saved and then become perfect like me instantly, right? You know, and have it all together. I mean, then the reality of it is every one of us, that's, that's what Christianity is, right? We are all going through a transfiguration literally right now. That is our sanctification that we're working through. God is constantly working on us, constantly shaping us. And, and, but that's what should be true of a Christian. A Christian that's been saved 10 years shouldn't look like the Christian they looked like 10 years ago. I got saved 13 years ago. Jason, how did you get to where you are now? I spent a lot of time in the Word. But what's funny is I know a lot of people that I've seen that got saved and they're in churches, they don't look any different. They still act the same way. They still get caught up in the same problems. They still have the same struggles, but they're still, they haven't tried to grow in the Lord. They haven't got serious about them. That's why, you know, every time I use the word Christianity, do you know it's a word I always use with it? Commitment. Yep. I always use the word commitment to go along with it. When you don't have this commitment, you're going to be in the same place. You're still going to be in first grade 10 years later. Like Roger. <laughs> Lord I, Lord, I apologize. I couldn't resist. It was just right there. Man, sixth grade was easier the third time I was in there. So anyway, we're at, what verse are we in? Two. I'm killing it, aren't I? Verse three. And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses. So here's their pastor, and they're all griping at their pastor and said, why is it, and look at this, you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst. And look at, man, this is cold-blooded. 
So, yeah, literally they look at him and say, you brought us out here just to kill us, our children and the livestock. That's why you took us out of Egypt. I can only imagine Moses going, you got me. That's right. That's the whole reason I did it. I wanted to drag you out here to watch you die of thirst. You busted me at this point. All right, so so here's Moses, and as a leader, he's in a pretty rotten spot. So let's look at what's Moses' response. All right, can you imagine? I'm done with all of you. Oh, boy, I'm walking back home. Daddy-in-law's house is over the hill. Y'all just stay out here. What does Moses do? Look at verse 4. So Moses cried out to the Lord. Boom. And guys, that's where we could all, when, when things aren't going our way, what do we do? What is your response? I think what's made the biggest difference for me as a Christian, the things that used to like want to blow me up. Guys, I had a temper. I won't, I won't sit here and lie about it. I could get a little hot. And if we look at like what's one of the biggest differences in your life now, it's the fact that, you know, I've learned. And it's something you have to learn. It's not a natural behavior, but I've learned when things happen, when things happen that would either set me off or things that would upset me or cause, I, I, I told you all before, I, I had incredible anxiety problems most of my life, just debilitating. I'm talking about one point I spent three days in a bed staring in a ceiling because it's an anxiety attack. And that's what got me started taking some pills and other things was three days awake staring at the ceiling, uh, just completely debilitated doing that. So I know what it's like, but what's the difference between 13 years is I finally learned, so Moses cried out to the Lord. When you have these things in life, what is your response? What is your response? Instead of the only thing that separates us from like Brother Rogers always saying, five minutes outside the will of God, a man's liable to do almost anything. Man, woman, we can put us all in that category, right? I'm going to say for me, probably 30 seconds. Like my, my reactions, you have to work at that reaction so that when things happen, you go to God. That should be our first response. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with these people? <laughs> Now, he's not too loving here, right? <laughs> what shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And I love this. They got no water, but apparently rocks are in. <laughs> they got plenty of rocks out here. So Moses has took, a, took a little count out here. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take some and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also, take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb. And you notice this. I, this is God speaking, I will stand before you now. Moses doesn't have any power. Moses walks out there and try and do, does this on his own. What's going to happen? You try and get out there and do something. It might even be something good. If there's any good thing Roger's taught me, I don't want to say it that way. It makes it sound like only one thing Roger's done. But Roger, I apologize. I have wore you out tonight. If there's one of many things Roger has taught me in four years, and I say that honestly, if there's one of many things that I've learned from Roger, it's that get praying before I get into anything. And I can't tell you how big that is. Like, and then even I would think I've learned, and even like me and Alan was working on a water pump the other day down by the, down by the pond, and we're trying to work on this pump, and I'm out there, I'm about to pull it, because me and David, David helped me, we rebuilt the carburetor on this thing, we're about to try, and I was about to pull the rope, and my 10-year-old son goes, Dad, we haven't prayed over this thing yet. And you think, well, it's just a water pump. Well, I'm going to tell you something. A lot can go wrong in a hurry in this world. And I was like, yeah, you're 100% right. Yeah, out of the mouths of babes. So we stopped right then and we prayed over the water pump. And, and yeah, we, we everything we got it to go with. And so, but, you know, that was that thing. Behold, we need to make sure it's always God that's going before us. We're not going to have a lot of success if God's not in it. And even as a church, like we're talking about building this new sanctuary. If we don't keep God first in what we do, if God... My computer 
restarted last night when we were going through the book of Exodus chapter 17. So that turns out great. What's really bad is that was really early into it, and this turned out to be a really good study, I thought, last night, even though it's not a long one. So let's pick back up out here on a beautiful, absolutely beautiful afternoon and kind of go back and finish our book together. For those of you that turn in, so thankful that you do to watch this. I am going to relaunch this with a prayer, though, as we finish. Father, we do thank you, God. We thank you for the opportunity, the beautiful weather, God, and the chance just to finish our study in the book of Exodus. God, we do love you and we praise you for this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so the last place we were at yesterday, and I told the story about like, uh, whatever it is we do, we should pray before we do it. Just like even an interrupted Bible study in the middle of the afternoon, you know, we should never launch into anything because if God is not what we just read, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock. If God is not standing before us, if God is not leading the point, guys, it's going to be a failure. The one thing I can tell you for sure, if God is not in whatever it is you're trying to do, it's going to be a failure. And that's just like with us trying to build new sanctuaries, everything else. If God is not in the forefront, there's going to be a failure because of it. So here in verse 6, we have read, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And so, all right, so putting everything together at this point because there's a lot here. One of the things that we'll actually see, especially in Deuteronomy later on, it wasn't them being tempted. If you read this carefully, it was them tempting the Lord. And guys, you can look at this from the standpoint of imagine any parent looking at their children misbehaving. And when you see your children misbehaving, your natural inclination is to do what? You want to react to it. You want to punish. And we think about the use of the word in the Bible, long-suffering, that's used a lot. And there is this idea that God, he's holding off judgment. He's holding off judgment. But do not be deceived is to think there will be no eventually judgment. And God does eventually judge Israel for their disobedience. We're talking captivity. We're talking about later on the destruction of Jerusalem itself in 70 AD. There is obvious, obviously a judgment to come, but that judgment is not this day. We've got an example of God's long suffering. And so, and that's exactly what Masa and Meribah, these terms that was used here by Moses means. Masa is exactly, is exactly that. That's talking about temptation or the tempting of God in Masa. And Meribah, what's actually funny, that actually kind of means like contention or strife. And that's their attitude towards God at this point. But guys, there's so much richness in what's going on here. And so sometimes when you're doing a Bible study, you know, you can say, all right, this paints a picture and in this case, the picture of the rock being struck, guys, that is Christ. And you could be like, well, Jason, how are you drawing that? Well, this is one of those beautiful times. This is not me trying to allude to something. If you've got your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 real quick. And I'm going to flip to mine as well. Oh, and I'm still there from last night. 1 Corinthians, and we'll just start chapter 10 reading beginning. So this isn't me telling you who the rock is. Let's let Paul, let's let Scripture tell us what Scripture means. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized in the Moses in the cloud in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that flowed that followed them, that rock was Christ. Boom. Paul answers us right there. The very rock was a representation of Christ himself. And now if you think about it, Moses reaches out and he strikes the rock. And from the rock having been struck, there is where life now emanates. Guys, the very picture of Moses striking the rock is a picture of Christ on the cross. 
That is the very picture of Christ being struck on the cross, and that's exactly what happened. And because he was struck, that allowed the opportunity for us to drink of what Christ offers. That gives us the living water that if a man should drink, he will never thirst. That is this living water that comes forth from Christ. Now, several things come out of this. Num number one, we live in a world that's thirsty. We live in a world that's desperately seeking something. Appetites, and, and guys, I'll be the first one to say it. I know what it's like to live in this world and constantly be searching and constantly be searching and for things to constantly be letting you, letting you down in this world. Guys, I've already, I, I was blessed in my way that God let me live that life. I've already been there. I've already done that. I know what it's like to literally go after everything and every time you think you're going to get what it's going to take to actually fulfill you inside, you're left empty again. And guys, that's where this living water comes from. This living water is the very Holy Spirit of God that when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you partake in this Holy Spirit and He now lives inside of you and you start this new life and you finally understand what fulfillment is. And so now we can also do this. There's one other thing. Yes, Christ is the rock. He was struck down for us to have life. And then you'll also, when we continue this story, we'll eventually get to where Moses strikes the rock again. But the second time, God did not allow him. He was only supposed to speak to the rock. And instead of speaking to the rock, he gets angry, grabs Aaron's rod, and uses Aaron's rod to strike the rock. And you may be looking at this going like, so what did God do? Well, he punished Moses, and he did not let him cross the Jordan and come into the promised land. So here's a guy that's been faithful for all this time, and he has this, what we would look at, and I'll be the first one to say, as we continue to read through Exodus, you've got to look at it and go like, like, God, I feel like you should give Moses a little grace. If anybody could drive a person to lose their temper, I feel like it's this group of people that could drive anyone to lose their temper. And so you would look at it, and you we'd want to use this human reasoning. And so then we start trying to figure out, why did God judge Moses so harshly for striking that rock? I'm going to give you two reasons. Not this time. Remember, the next time he strikes the rock. So I'm going to go to Psalms 50 real quick. And I think this is very important. And it's going to take me a second, but I'm flipping there. Psalm 50. And it'll give you an opportunity to turn. Are you looking? I hope you're looking right now. Psalm 50, verse 16. I want to read something to you. But to the wicked God says, what, have right, what right have you to declare my statutes? Or take my covenant in your mouth. In other words... God looks at every person out there and says, you better be very careful when you're trying to speak for me. You be very careful when you're speaking for me or when you're representing for me. Seeing you hate instruction, cast my words before you. I'm not going to read the rest of that, but you really should read the rest of that section in, the, in Psalms 50. You should, because what it gives you this idea is that when you represent God and you choose to speak for God, God holds you very accountable for what you say when you represent Him. When Moses later goes on to lose his temper and strike the rock and is disobedient to what God has said, he's conveying a message of God being angry, of God losing his temper. He's conveying an image of God to the people that wasn't God. And because of that disobedience and because he was literally putting words in God's mouth at that point when he later strikes the rock, that's the very reason why Moses is never permitted to enter into the promised land. And now we'll look at one more thing. Why does the rock not need to be split once? Well, remember, striking the rock was a picture of Christ on the cross. Christ only had to go to the cross. His blood was enough. It was a one-time trip. It was a one-time sacrifice, and it's good for all time. The striking of the rock was painting the picture of your eternal salvation grounded in Christ upon the cross. When he later goes on to strike the rock again, it's literally saying the blood of Jesus was not enough. The blood of Jesus was not 
enough. And, and this is why we shouldn't, I remember when I first got the Mountain View, there was a, just like out of a Catholic church, there was Christ hanging on the cross. And I took that cross down. And somebody probably looked, you took a cross down in your church. Well, yes, I did. Because let me tell you where Jesus isn't today. He's not still hanging on the cross. He went to a cross and he died for my sin and for your sin. He was buried and, he buried and rose again. Christ is no longer hanging on the cross. So we shouldn't be, in the case of the Catholic Church, we shouldn't be crucifying him every single Sunday. He made his sacrifice one time. The blood is enough. All right, I'm going to turn back now real quick. <laughs> I'm trying to remember if I've covered everything that like we talked about last night when we were looking at Exodus chapter 17. Um, flipping back, flipping back. All right, and so we see all those pictures, but guys, that is that's the best part of this section. The striking of the rock representing Jesus Christ, the water flowing forth, the very Holy Spirit, the only thing that will ever satisfy anybody that's lost and searching in this world. And now verse 8. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in, in Rephidim. If you'll go on and read in Deuteronomy, you'll find what makes this, Deuteronomy chapter 25, what makes this so heinous, what takes place, you read that Rephidim didn't come out and just make war with them in the very front and like make war to their face. He lurked around in the back and he found the stragglers. He lurked around and he found the stragglers. He found the ones that were weak and that's where he attacked. He attacked like a coward. So not only did he attack God's chosen people, not only did he attack God's chosen people, but he attacked the weakest and in the most cowardly way possible. And in this section, you're going to read God's judgment upon this people, not only for laying a hand on Israel, but the method of which they did it as well. And it's kind of funny as I'm thinking about today, we didn't talk about this last night, but I think about the way people attack on social media right now. People don't have the courage to go face to face and say something to somebody. They hide behind their little keyboards and type comments and they enter things in and they're like little sneaks that go on guys I, i'm gonna say something god judges that harshly if someone needs calling out you call them out you don't run around and like make little snide comments on the internet or elsewhere else guys that's where we, it's funny we've just started a social media thing for church now to convey news and things like that and i get it but i still don't like it just because of what i've seen it to do and the opportunities it provides because you've basically created a new generation of Amalekites is what it's laid foster to. People that will attack in the rear. And guys, there's also a warning in this. We didn't say this last night, but there's a danger for dragging behind. There's a danger for being the one. Um, one of my one of my favorite stories that preachers usually tell, like in regards to this, they'll tell the story of like a little girl or a little boy that falls out of bed. And when the father goes in to ask him, why do you think you fell out of the bed? The child goes, it's because I stayed too close to where I got in. That's exactly what happens to a lot of Christians. They get into the church, and we talked about this earlier in the message, and, and they're baby Christians. Yeah, I get it, but you should be growing. Those Christians that never get serious in their walk, those Christians that never get into a church, that never get into tied into what you're a part of. If you're watching this, double fist pumps, you are a committed Christian, and God bless you, and I'm so glad you hang out with us. For, man, if, if you've done that and you've made it to here, smash that like button in this video and let me know that you stuck around and you are committed to Christ, you are growing in Christ, and you have no intention of falling out where you you got in. You're going to grow and Amalek's not going to sneak up on you from behind. You're taking point. You're in the lead. You're not just in a church, but you've got a desire to see a church grow and prosper and you want to serve in that church.
Man, all that right here in verse 8. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men, go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. But when he let his hands down, and guys, in the common form for praying in that time, you would have prayed with your hands. You, you didn't pray like this. You prayed with arms outstretched, palms up, looking to God. God, looking to receive your blessing from God, looking to show your humility to God with your arms outstretched. And this is the craziest thing. As long as Moses could keep the rod and his hands outstretched in the air, they would win. And what Moses was doing on that hill, Moses was praying. But Moses is still a man, and as he grew tired, his arms would fail. And as Moses started to fall down, the people lost their way as well. Guys, this is also a picture of the pastor in the church. Your pastor gets tired. I hope you support it. It's pastor appreciation. That's why I'm wearing this church. My church was so awesome. Uh, somebody got me this shirt. Your pastor gets tired. Your pastor needs help. When Moses got tired, look at what happened. Verse 12, but when Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone, put it under hump. Man, this is crazy. I'm sitting on a massive rock right now. When, when he became tired, they put this stone underneath him. And Aaron and her, her was most likely Miriam's husband, so most scholars think it was his brother-in-law. And her supported his hands. He had a man on each side helping him when he could no longer pray for himself. He had brothers come alongside him. Guys, what you see is a picture of everything in church. Uh, I talked to somebody literally last night before church, and what I told them was God never meant for you to do life alone. Uh, team, together, everyone accomplishes more. Guys, the only way you're going to make it in this world is to be a part of a church. If you're someone watching this video and you're watching it to learn and grow, God bless you, double fist pumps again. You are so awesome. But I hope no one ever watches these videos in place of going to church. Because as great as it is to learn and grow, to be a part of a church, to have a family of God, to have those other people around you, to hold you up when you can no longer hold yourself up. Guys, that's what the church is about. That's what an altar is about. When you come down to the front of an altar in a church, every person in that church ought to be praying for earnestly whoever is down at that altar. Come down and pray with them because you're letting people know you are part of a family of God and no one prays alone in this family so that's why there's never a point where I'm going to say videos like this are a substitute for being a part of a church and being a part of the family of God guys we need each other we need a team we need my brothers I need my sisters to pray over me and you notice in the other side and his hands were steady until the going down the sun so Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword so we're going to tie this together in a second, but I want you to remember this with the edge of the sword. Verse 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it. This is the first time Moses is told to start writing down Scripture at this point. Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua. And by the way, this is also the first time in this section where Joshua is appears, Yahshua, which is the name of Jesus in Greek, appears in the Bible for the first time. So in in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven because of the method of which he was sneaky and his people attacked Israel. So one, you laid a hand on Israel. I'd also say for all those still attacking Israel today, you should probably be very careful. And there's also a warning to America, and this is well, of how we respond and treat Israel going forward. But we read here, I will, blot, I will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Later on, Saul is told to kill everyone, even their livestock of the Amalekites. Saul disobeys, and that's why Saul later loses his kingship because of his disobedience to wipe them out. And you're thinking, okay, so the Am Amalekites got away with it. How many Amalekites do you know today? They don't exist. 
they don't exist, guys. So there's the message in there. God always keeps his promises. And look at this. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. There's many names of God in the Bible. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord is my healer. Um, uh, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord is my provider. Here he uses the name Jehovah Nissa is actually what's said at this point. The Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nissa. Moses makes one thing clear to everybody. You're not going to accomplish anything without God leading before you. We know there's a two-pronged thing here. There was a sword. There was a human element by which, the, by which Joshua and the men fought. And then we know this God also. Now, what was interesting, when they came through the Red Sea, God did all the fighting for them. But now we see this beautiful balance of where God gives instruction, God gives support, but God expects a response. And that's exactly what's going on here. God is sovereign and God is strong, but God also requires you. He requires something of you. God did not save you to sit on the pine on a bench in church every week. God saved you. He expects you to do your part in the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what we see. The Lord is my banner. Whatever I do, wherever I go, I, I closed at church last night. I closed at church by, I, I pulled our American flag that sits beside me out front. And I said, I love this flag. And I do. I'm so thankful. I'm so unbelievably thankful for all the people that fought and sacrificed and died so that we get to, that I get to make a video like this. I'm so thankful for it. And then I took the Christian flag, which is not the, necessarily the idea here of the banner, but it helps us at least visually somewhat get the idea. And I rolled our Christian flag out in front of me. And I said, whatever it is I do, wherever it is I go, without God leading the way, without me following God, without God being a part of it, I'm not going to succeed at anything. Because remember the sword, there still comes a point where you have a job to do, where something falls upon you to have to do but we can't do anything without God going before us. Guys, wherever you are today, and I hope to leave you with this, maybe spend the rest of this week a little bit more time in prayer in whatsoever it is that you do and whatsoever it is that you want to do, that you go to the Lord Jesus Christ, that rock that was struck for our sins, and you say, Christ, I need you to go before me. I need you to lead the way. Because, God, I'm not going to make it on my own. And if you're not in a church, guys, I encourage you wherever you are at to watch this. You get a part of a church. Hey, if you live anywhere near Ramburn, Alabama, yeah, yeah come on. I, I want you a part of our church. I promise you, we got brothers and sisters that mean what they say. There's a lot of gospel wearing shoe leather up in Mountain View Baptist Church. But guys, I want you to get in the church. I want you to be a part of a church that is a family. Because someday when you can't hold your arms up, you need that family of God. Father, I thank you, God, for everyone, that God, that would tune in and watch this, God, and just this opportunity to get out and share, God, even the weather today, God, that you made the opportunity for me to finish this video and the technology, God, that I'm able to use to put all this together, God. Uh, so that we can worship you through your word. God, I thank you for my church. I thank you for my friends. God, I, I, God, I pray over so many today. God, I pray for our country, God, that you provide a healing in this country, God, and a way that this country can move forward, God. And I pray for your gospel to be spread, God, in this country. Father, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, guys, this was my lunch break. I hope you're having a great day wherever you are. I'm going to go get something to eat. Love you guys. Bye.